Tom Califatis. Um, he is the director, head of execution and prime services at CIBC World Markets. Um, he also sits on the board of directors of CIBC Bank and Trust Company uh, in the Cayman Islands. He's a member of the OCC OSC. Uh, Market Structure Advisory Committee and the Investment Industry of Canada's Equity Committee and thank you for going last. Well thank you for having me. Thank you everyone for having me. Firstly I'm just going to talk a little bit about the biases I do or do not bring to this uh, discussion uh, by talking a little bit about my background. Uh, I started the industry in wealth management working for Burns Fry. I spent a good three years there serving the retail investor and the individual investor uh, from the ground up. Uh, mar cold calling, marketing, bringing in clients, understanding individual investor needs. I then spent four years working in corporate finance in Manhattan, serving issuers, raising capital both on the equity and debt side, M&A, leverage recaps, leverage restructuring, and then spent six years with the Toronto Stock Exchange. It's during that period that I think I can provide sort of the most insight, and I think why I was asked to come here, because a lot of these market structure changes occurred while I was at the exchange, and recently I'm at uh, CIBC, not only in a, in a trading capacity, but also in our prime brokerage uh, and securities lending activities, which also face trade-offs. Every avenue and aspect of the industry has trade-offs uh, when dealing with other participants. What I hope to demonstrate here are the various trade-offs uh, that do exist and, and uh, try and provide a more balanced outlook on, on the perspective. I don't think anyone will actually at the end of this dialogue say I'm a hard pro or a hard con. I think there are trade-offs with any type of activity in the marketplace and frankly the regulators have a very hard job because in every conference I'll go to, it might be a lending conference, might be an electronic trading conference, might be a small cap mining conference, they'll hear the one constituency focus on their needs. And I think the big challenge the regulators have is trying to balance those interests. So unfortunately I'm not going to be as uh, rhetorical or as, as humorous as uh, my two predecessors on this. Uh, but I think you'll actually find we agree on quite a lot. Uh, the difference is that we disagree personally, and, and the discussion here is mostly my opinion, not that necessarily of the banks. It's in particular, where I talk about uh, my experiences prior to CIBC, uh, I think we agree on the symptoms. The difference is what are you going to do about these symptoms and how do, you, how do you evolve market structure to fit the need of all constituents? Because even every constituent will play different hats. On the one hand, you're mineral exploration executives, but you're also retail investors. Your, your hat may change in a couple years in another part of the business and you'll start to see how as that evolves, you're going you're gonna to see different trade-offs and decisions that are made and how things that may have at one point felt advantageous to you counterintuitively may not necessarily be so. So I want to start off with talking about what is unique about Canada. And for the better part of four years uh, when I was in my last three years at the Toronto Stock Exchange and first year at CIBC, and again, I'm not as close to the trading issues as uh, Peter might be at, at this point, uh, but for my first year at CIBC and my last year at TSX, my job was effectively to sell Canada to sell Canada to foreign participants, foreign investors, and bring them back. If one recalls in the early 2000s, we did have a similar uh, situation where, uh, not necessarily on the issuer space, but on the broker-dealer space, a number of broker-dealers were leaving the country. Foreign broker-dealers that were large participants were leaving the country. We made a conscientious effort to start to promote Canada and bring them back to the marketplace. And in describing Canada, uh, it's quite obvious when you look at the, the, the listings base that we effectively have three markets. We have a very highly liquid Canadian-based interlisted market with over about 100 securities, give or take, that uh, trade every day on NASDAQ and New York uh, listings, but from a competitive trading perspective, trade with all those not just fragmented uh, venues that Peter talked about earlier, but all the ones that are talked about in the U.S. That creates certain challenges when you're trying to talk about market structure or uh, dealing with investors and dealing with issuance and trying to describe your marketplace and, and deal with business issues. 
And then you have a large cap, but predominantly a basically a domestically traded large and mid cap uh, marketplace. And that's about another two, 300 issuers that trade over a million dollars a day or a million shares a day, sorry. And a million shares a day you'll find later in my presentation, a very important threshold for trading constituents who don't necessarily act as the primary acts on the security. Natural investors are necessary to trade a security, but at a certain threshold, it's almost all natural and augmented liquidity comes after that. And then you have a class, frankly, of thousands, four, five, six thousand issuers that trade both on the Toronto Stocks Venture Exchange and the Toronto Stock Exchange that don't exhibit the liquidity characteristics that you would have on the Canadian Basin or listed or that uh, uh, what used to be sort of the TSC 300 type of security. And so that challenge, when you look at, we have a large cap marketplace that has to compete on a global basis with American style liquidity profile and a very uniquely Canadian, effectively public venture capital model where instead of raising financing for a technology company in Silicon Valley, we have a well-established practice and ecosystem of raising that capital on our public markets. And, and that makes it very challenging for the regulators. So this kind of talks a little bit about what we're going to discuss today, why we're here. I think I'm going to be a lot shorter than the prior presentations. I don't want to repeat uh, some of the facts that have already been brought out. But I will talk a little bit about uh, some different perspectives and uh, try and actually compare what, what one might, you know, is trying to contrast what some of these quantitative traders or data intensive traders do in their actual building of their business model and contrast it with what a mining company might do when it actually looks for uh, opportunity. I think you might find that quite insightful. So I think if you we're, we're uh, listening to the conversations earlier, you'll find that there are actually a number of market structure themes that are integrated, interrelated, and high frequency trading is but one of them when, when speaking about all these market structure themes. And it's challenging to disentangle one and address the one without having to deal with other issues. Issues like global market consolidation, which we talked about. Market data, is it a public good? Is it a private good? What is the appropriate cost? What's the operational risk around managing this, this type of trading activity? What's the value of liquidity fragmentation? Uh, there are new markets out there. Are they adding an accretive in value or do they continue to, to create fragmentation of liquidity? Are dark pools a solution to institutional liquidity? Or are they fragmenting liquidity? HFTs are but one element of that. And what we're trying to demonstrate here is that high frequency trading is an output, not an input to the evolving market structure. The one item I would agree with that was mentioned earlier wholeheartedly is uh, competition is what has created many of these uh, outcomes as they look, look and appear today. They're a reflection of an evolving market where with competition you need more computing power to look at all the different marketplaces. You need to link yourself to these different marketplaces. That becomes very hard for an individual to do on a, on a human trader scale. And so issues around data, technology, speed, which were addressed earlier, are really consequences from a, the perspective of technology, the need for more efficiency. It becomes harder to manage blotters on 8,000 names without some computer-assisted power. When you have an explosion of data, you need to have systems to manage that data. The question is, at what point does that output then become an input and create a feedback loop into the market structure? So Canada has undoubtedly a highly evolved market ecosystem when it comes to the mineral industry. And we have a very successful mineral industry, which I believe, from a public markets cap capacity perspective, overachieves relative to Peers, and I have some, some uh, statistics later in the presentation would demonstrate that. And the electronic trading activity and the high frequency activity in your sector is not necessarily that dissimilar than what you would see in other sectors. I think the first question people ask themselves when they, 
they're learning about market structure and things that are changing. Am I being dealt with fairly? Am I being dealt with equitably? Am I or my issue, my, my uh, act, you know, the, the trading in my stock, is, is, are we being singled out? And I think you'll find the answer is actually no. Uh, the activity, you, you will see uh, a pattern as we, we find below. It's very similar to the patterns that Andreas pointed out earlier. And we, we disguised some of the data, but we decided here to share data that we see within our, our walls that is proprietary to CIBC, but for your benefit, want to share this data. And what you'll see is that, uh, similar again to what Andreas pointed out, the trading in securities less than a million shares a day, that is what we would call traditional HFT. And let's go with the definition that was uh, presented earlier. So for a small cap name, is, is quite low. Uh, it, it is, as some of the other panelists pointed out, uh, not necessarily high, and therefore it demonstrates that high-frequency traders participate where they're seeking to participate in activity that is already there. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Earlier, Peter pointed out that there is need for intermediation. There's need for intermediation between large size flow and small size flow. If you're moving a large block and there isn't necessarily a large block on the other side, you might need to call your block desk to, to move that block. Or it might have to be put on a VWAP machine, which as agents, broker dealers utilize to slice that order flow into smaller security sizes. Likewise, it's not always true that when a retail investor is looking to sell 500 shares of a name that there is an identical 500 share lot on the other side at that exact moment in time. So intermediaries are necessary to intermediate time. And that's what your traditional market maker used to do. And size and time are constantly being traded off, and I'll get into some actual formulas later, that in, in terms of spread and liquidity in the marketplace. The question is, what's the right balance? And I think you'll see on this chart that uh, the participation of quantitative trading increases and coincidentally increases the most when you talk about ETS because some of those strategies around index ARB, stat ARB that require a trader to properly price an ETF by looking at the underlying securities uh, needs those sort of automated strategies to, to, uh, uh, to drive value. So uh, effectively, uh, yes, the marketplace has gone through a lot of change over the last decade. Uh, I would agree that a lot of that change was driven by a seminal event in, in 2003, which was around uh, the exchange going public. Uh, that event changed incentives in the marketplace, uh, but incentives in the marketplace that were not solely driven by the exchange itself, and there were a number of actors involved in, in that uh, change. So for the exchange to demutualize, there was also a delinking of the industry regulator from the exchange. So the exchange itself, uh, no, not only, it, it may have chosen a different objective, but that selection of a different ob objective was in some ways chosen by it when you separated the dealer member regulator from the exchange itself. Likewise, the regulators to create competition for the exchanges required the exchange to have some form of competition. You, it, it wouldn't be fair to allow a monopoly to go public and have the ability to incessantly raise fees, so the regulator created the ATS rules. So those, there were actually three different actors at a minimum that were involved in some of this change in incentive uh, and behavior in the marketplace. Uh, the question for this audience is, how does that change in incentive affect your security or your issue, depending on which one of those three, talk, call it groups of securities I describe, whether you're an interlisted name, a large cap domestic name, or a small cap issue. And I do believe that influence and change in incentives is different depending on which uh, group you belong to. Uh, and, and, but yet it will have impact in your future because no issue is static either. You will grow, you may change your model, you may, uh, you know, uh, spin off aspects of your business. So being aware of how that works obviously has an influence on how you manage your security. So there's one, one key point I'm going to bring up on the earlier slide, which is uh, 
I don't think there's any debate on whether we need intermediation. The question is how much is necessary, and I think you'll find more importantly is who does it. And that's something that I think is very important for the audience to ask itself as well. Would you rather your end investor, retail institutional or professional trader, intermediate and, and trade your stock, or would you rather your broker dealer do that? And I think something that, that we need to make uh, clear, uh, from the perspective of our operation, CIBC, we do not act as principal when we trade. So we will not trade against our clients. All of our activity under our number is, aside from liability trading for block purposes, entirely agency-based. We are acting on behalf of clients, whether those clients are institutional, retail, or uh, quantitative in nature. As well, I'd also point out that when we talk about who intermediates and how that intermediation is done, uh, it was inaccurately mentioned earlier that we were the first to be in DMA. That's not true. We were actually quite far behind in the race. And our first quantitative data intensive trading client uh, that was in the ELP program was not solely at CIBC. It was actually shared with another large investment dealer. So just some, some important facts that as I evolve my conversation are going to be uh, somewhat important to, to clarify and articulate. Uh, so again, I'm going to point out what's repetitive but what's different based on our knowledge of what's going on in the marketplace. There are a few other points here uh, that I'd add because I did not have the benefit of, of seeing the other panel's presentations. There were three specific order types that have evolved over the last decade that have been more and more prevalent in their usage, which were indeed supported by the institutional broker-dealer community but have contributed to uh, smaller size order flow being traded in the market. VWAP, iceberg orders, and anonymity. So VWAP is the idea that I take a 10,000 share order, so there's TWAP and VWAP, but both of these effectively do the same thing from the perspective of block liquidity. I don't want to necessarily take the risk that by putting a block into the marketplace, I'm going to move the market, have an impact on the market. So I put it in an engine, and that's really the, call it original algo, is TWAP and VWAP. And the most elementary was to simply say, I'll slice my 9,000 shares across the nine hours of the trading day in 1,000 share lots. Or I might bucket it, and this is where they get more creative, if volume, which is tilted to the open or tilted at the close, I might adjust that order to say, execute 1,500 shares at the open, 1,500 at the close, and 700 at intermittent trading points. So when the first participant to trade a block in a VWAP algo uh, enters the marketplace, effectively he's got no market footprint, no one's paying attention. Shares are trading at five, ten thousand shares apiece, no one's paying attention. But as others start to trade, what ends up happening is you get a feedback loop of your order becomes effectively part of the average trade size. And more and more, as people start to trade the VWAP or TWAP or other algos that are slicing in their nature, the average order executed declines, which requires more and more creative ways to execute your order throughout the marketplace. Two consequent order types, so these aren't necessarily uh, algorithms designed by the brokers, but are, in my perspective, algorithms designed by the marketplace, are the iceberg order and anonymity. In the past, say pre-1996, and I'll get to a little bit about why some of those studies earlier aren't relevant because the data from the beginning to the end period aren't comparable, uh, anonymity effectively allows a broker to post an order as broker 01. So I, you don't necessarily know who the broker is executing on the other side. The client may have chosen to trade anonymous, or the broker may have chosen to trade anonymous for their proprietary flow or their own prop activity. Uh, and that certainly, again, as fewer orders are posted in the market visibly, people standing behind their order, you, you continue to have, reinforce that feedback loop. Another one being icebergs. It was the idea that I might want to post 10,000 shares, have some priority in the book, but I don't want to have to necessarily put in a VWAP engine. I'll just show a little iceberg of 300 shares, and the other 9,700 will, will show underneath. And then as that 300 got filled, I would have a reset. Okay? 
again, reinforces smaller size execution. So now on the one side of the market, you have this large supply of smaller and smaller execution or, or demand for smaller and smaller execution. On the other hand, you need someone to supply smaller and smaller execution. So in our perspective, that continues to reinforce itself, and you, you just have to go to the 07, 08 period as you launch other competing marketplaces. And again, I don't disagree that competing marketplaces helps to drive some of that phenomenon. The question is, why did we need these competing marketplaces, and what evolves in them? But you continue to get this slicing and fragmentation of liquidity through smart order routers, multiple markets, and on the other side now, you have a new entrant who is basically going to supply that liquidity. It gets very complicated, very challenging, and very expensive to manage all this small size liquidity on the other side, and, and to do that, most importantly, profitably, profitably, because traders themselves are also, a, it's also a commercial activity. They need to do it profitably to be in the business. So there you have in about 2007, 2008, you have this announcement of a marketplace called Alpha. I point out, I'd urge everyone here to kind of look at the history of who supported Alpha. Many people today that are opposed to market fragmentation liquidity were promoters of Alpha six, seven years ago. When I was at the exchange, we were telling them the natural result will be some of the challenges you have today. And now that they see those challenges, they're looking to put the, put the genie back in the bottle. The issue is that the exchange has always had competition on that largest Canadian-based interlisted bucket, even when it was mutualized, had competition and recognized that it needed to compete with the United States. And I'm going to go to a chart on the next slide. Where does this go forward? You'll see that uh, Around, up till around 2002, 2003, Canada had a dominant share in the trading of Canadian-based interlisteds. And why is it important for the Canadian marketplaces to have a strong share in Canadian-based interlisteds? Because as, if, if you think about that ambition of an issuer to grow and develop, ultimately when you make the major leagues, you want that major league to be in Canada a lot of jobs, legal, professional, banking, independent dealer or otherwise are dependent on having that healthy structure at the top, a top tier sort of Canadian based interlisted uh, grouping. And the TSX in 2002, 2003 started to recognize that there were structural issues in the United States that were changing. You were starting to see ATSs, a couple in particular, Island and ARCA, which we're starting to capture not just order flow from New York and NASDAQ on U.S. names, but even on Canadian-based interlisteds. And it was quite interesting because it started to, started to notice that we weren't just competing with the traditional sort of exchanges, but, but the TSX is now competing with ATSs. Uh, and as a marketplace, as a community, we have to think about competition with the U.S. You start to see a pretty rapid decline in market share from 70% to 50%. And there's been a number of academic research that shows when your market share is below 30, 25%, that that marketplace starts to lose all of its liquidity. And while people like to believe competition in exchanges or exchanges were monopolies or, or uh, not competitive, even when they were demutualized, that's not true. And I just list down there, a number of defunct exchanges, uh, marketplaces that were in business but no longer exist today because they did not have uh, the liquidity there or the retail investor uh, promoting it, regulatory backing, uh, a community or an ecosystem uh, that kind of supported it. A few of which are in Canada themselves. Uh, Winnipeg had a vibrant market. Uh, Montreal had an equities market at one point. Uh, Vancouver still today has a vibrant market through its association with the Toronto TMX group. Uh, but certainly, if one were to see a scenario where Canada's interlisted trading goes below 30%, it would not be a good thing. 
So the exchange starts to, sit, starts to stay and starts to study, what do you do? How do you deal with this? And it actually introduced the maker-taker model, which was talked about earlier, before New York and NASDAQ themselves did. It was actually, believe it or not, the first exchange to launch maker-taker when it did so on a pilot project for Amex, if people recall, another defunct marketplace, the American Stock Exchange, which was mining heavy, uh, on Amex listed securities and found that it mar its market share started to increase and rebound. Uh, and then it rolled that out to other uh, stock lists, including New York and NASDAQ. At that, NASDAQ uh, interlisted names. At that point, no one was paying attention. Uh, there were at least a few phases of this kind of gradual rollout of make, make or taker. Where things were, 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 the attention started to be paid was when pure trading alpha started to launch, and now the domestic uh, market share of that second bucket, the large, inter, the large domestic uh, capitalization names, uh, were up for sort of grabs from a competitive perspective. And TSX quickly rolled out its make or taker model to the non-interlisted names, and again, maintain that market share. If you looked at the prior slide, you'll see that some of these ATSs were launched before 2008, but the market share of TSX was still 99% in 2008. Ultimately, Alpha was launched, and at, in 2008, Alpha now has the backing of all the banks. All the banks were part of Alpha, and a number of uh, institutional investors were part of Alpha. So if you're, the, if you're the Toronto Stock Exchange, what are you going to do? My largest client base, or one's largest client base in aggregate, constituted 60 70% of the liquid order flow that was going, or the passive order flow that was going to the exchange, is faced with seeing all that going to a competitive venue. It has, no, it, it, it has to compete. And how does a market compete? It can start to compete by attracting more quotes and changing its business model. It's and, and it does that by adjusting its pricing, where effectively, if one, one just has to look at the revenue of the Toronto Stock Exchange in the last 10 years, there's more of a tilt to market data versus trading. That used to be the other way around. It can reduce frictions to trading, and it can promote access across a whole new different type of participant. Mm -hmm. And it promotes that ac access and, and hopes that in, over time that it will generate that revenue or make that up in, in the listings, uh, listing space. It can also introduce new order types, creative order types like the iceberg and anonymity I mentioned earlier. A number of others which I'm not familiar with uh, have also been introduced over the years. So the, 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 the largest change to drive the introduction of quantitative trading or data intensive trading in Canada uh, is therefore a consequence of this threat of competition, this threat of losing revenue, and some of the reactions uh, that the exchange put in place. And I highlight this, uh, and it's going to sound like a pretty goofy acronym, but 2501 eligibility. So to be a direct access client of a broker-dealer, not just anybody can do that. Personally, I wouldn't qualify. You have to have some institutional credential, be regulated, or be viewed as an institutional investor. Canada has always had a well-regulated direct access model, and one of the challenges I see in distinguishing the debate on high-frequency trading between Canada and the U.S. is that a lot of the media is, is, is driven by American publications, and you can't necessarily apply what's going on in the U.S. with what's applying in Canada. So the concept of sponsored or naked access was something that was in the U.S. Uh, uh, media quite a lot, which was that anyone uh, could literally plug a pipe into, their market, into, the, into a marketplace and start trading. In Canada, yeah. that's never been allowed. And, and kudos to the regulators for making sure that's, that's never been the case. What did happen, though, is over the years, Direct access client, clientele, the, the standard was, has been relaxed. And it first started, really frankly, with the broker's largest clients, the largest pension funds or, or uh, mutual funds saying, you know, there's the odd time. I don't want to talk to your broker, to, your, to my trader. It's an easy order. Let, me, let us manage it ourselves. And that's kind of category A, B. And then you'd start to see the brokers themselves would say, well, I have a U.S. affiliate. Do I really need a trader, to, a U.S. trader bounce to a Canadian trader center of the market? 
let's relax it even further. And that's why in the Canadian rules you'll actually see a, a gradual relaxation in the, uh, in the uh, rule set and ultimately uh, effectively letter I, which basically says anyone who qualifies as an institution, anyone with $10 million or more, but that comes from a regulated environment can trade under direct electronic access uh, uh, rules. That really opens up the market for new participants to come to Canada. And that is what effectively drove uh, the change was, you know, this reaction to potential competitive threats and r relaxation of eligibility to open the market up. Uh, but again, remember in 2008, and I urge everyone to look back at the, at the uh, uh, conversation at the time, which was that more volume, open access, open participation, more volume is good volume, more volume, more liquidity is good for everyone. Don't worry, TSX, your, your fees will go down, but you'll have three times the volume. Uh, so as they bring these participants in, they're selling them services like co-location, deeper market data, they become really sellers of marketplace tools and data as opposed to necessarily focusing on uh, what I believe is the primary goal of a marketplace, which is to be a price discovery mechanism. And the price discovery process is basically paramount to uh, all of the other factors that serve both traders, investors, and issuers. If you don't have price discovery, if you don't have a trade happening because the two sides will never match at a price, you won't have investing because you never had a price in the first place, and issuers won't have investing or traders to participate in their name. So the, the primary goal of a marketplace is the price discovery process. And over time, as price discovery now becomes the shared responsibility of multiple markets and multiple ATSs, the goal of the single market to promote price discovery uh, gets relaxed and reduced. And so over time, you have a, a, a gradual uh, uh, reduction in, in that uh, uh, focus. But that is a, a, a symptom not a result of high frequency trading. So what I mean by that is high frequency trading came after that fragmentation and came after that, uh, competi those competitive forces and, and uh, relaxation of access standards came in. So I'll get a little bit about in, in particular why we're here. And while there's no clear definition, I do like the definition Andreas put up earlier. But what's interesting is if you exclude the words technology and use of systems, that, that definition actually defines what a trader does. A trader's role is to find short-lived fleeting opportunities in the marketplace to keep the price of a security in line where, with its value at that moment in time, while also factoring in the cost of immediacy and the cost of market impact. And so, Many of the issues that, that people look at when it comes to quantitative trading and discuss are actually issues that have been around with us for quite some time, uh, which I think even the, the last panelist spoke about, issues that aren't necessarily new, but become much, sometimes much more obvious because the world is a lot more transparent. Market data is a lot more transparent. When I started in the industry, you had to call the broker who would pass it off to his marketing assistant to get a quote. Now you can just go on the internet. In many cases, you can even get depth of quotes on a, a, a discount broker's tool. So now there's more transparency to what the issues might be. But I'm going to add, based on our experiences with the community, a few other key points. You do not necessarily have to have a high order to trade ratio to be an HFT. And not all HFTs have a high order to trade ratio. It's more important to look at what drives the need for technology? It's where either you need low latency to affect your strategy or you need to process large amounts of data. I think there was a comment earlier about how much data the NASDAQ produces uh, in any given moment. Imagine how much you need to process. That, again, that's, that kind of talks about what's driving that. And so how do, you, how, do you, how do you kind of manage for that complexity? Well. Effectively, they have certain thresholds. Their data sets need to have a history. They need to have uh, some, some resilience. So typically, 
Uh, any, any name that trades a million shares a day is on the radar of a quantitative data intensive trader. Uh, but other than that, they're not created equal. They have varying order to trade ratio. And again, for the benefit of this audience, we provide some data uh, that is proprietary to, to uh, CIBC and does not include only uh, high order to trade ratio uh, uh, IDs that would be captured in the IROC study, but everyone that we would consider being data intensive in their trading. And so on the, one on the X axis, you see active passive ratio. On the Y axis, you see order to trade ratio. So you may see, in some cases, uh, literally order to trade ratios of, of high frequency trading firms being less than zero to one. So they will send in an order and get multiple fills. So, so they'll get more transactions, more executions. In that case, that high frequency trader isn't actually looking to get ahead of everyone or do anything, but they have information and they need that strategy to execute at that moment in time. Latency is critical to their strategy. On the other hand, you might have the market makers that have quite a high active passive ratio, and I'll explain later why that, that matters, uh, or order to trade ratio. Uh, some have linked active passive, high active passive, with high order to trade, and you saw that in an earlier presentation where, as a market maker, I need to put in more bids and offers which are messages, and therefore I'm going to be more passive than active. Again, that's not true. You'll see from the grid, it's all over the map. And that's, that's important to recognize. Uh, and what we saw in the HOT study were a couple other additional points that were quite, quite interesting. Uh, again, based on our knowledge that not all HFTs are HOT, not all are HOT are HFTs, but that there were non-DEA clients captured in the HOT study. And those include broker-dealers' proprietary trading desks. And I would add to my point earlier, CIBC does not engage in proprietary trading if one does not include the facilitation of blocks for clients. We do not trade for our own capital. So dealer proprietary desks are captured in these statistics. Non-DEA broker-dealers, so broker-dealers that are members in Canada that are not clients are also captured in this, as well as the, the uh, registered market makers that might be getting more quantitative. What we would urge is for more transparency. It would be a, very interesting to see uh, what, we, what we see, which is not only who is captured by the HOT study, but who is, who is captured by the HOT study that is not HFT. And, while hot IDs represent 22% of all volume, if you look at the volume by these other categories, it's actually uh, a very large percentage that are done by broker-dealers themselves, uh, either in a proprietary capacity or because the whole firm is proprietary, or uh, uh, by allowing its affiliates to do that. And that's another, another thing you'll see in the industry is uh, where affiliates of a broker-dealer will trade on a proprietary basis and pretend that they aren't, uh, they aren't HFT. So again, I go back to the point of, is the issue that we don't need more intermediaries or that certain brokers would like to be more involved in the intermediation of their flow, of your flow, or a flow on the marketplace? And so I'll leave you with that thought. Uh, the other key point is that 77% of volume executed by a higher to trade ratio names, again, knowing my point earlier that not all HFT is hot, is in the most liquid names, in those first two groupings. And given the vast majority of mineral and mining names are not in the first two groupings, our view would be that from a direct perspective, high order to trade ratio, high frequency trading is not necessarily a factor driving uh, the price of your security. There are downstream consequences that I'm going to get to, and we're very open about, and we promote with the regulators. Uh, but from a third bucket or third grouping perspective, we don't believe that there is a, a large influence in how uh, securities are traded uh, by HFTs. So I'm going to get into the specifics of the strategies, and we talked broadly earlier on some of the panels, oh, you know, how they make money. But here we want to actually show you some math and actually 
how do you think about the quantum of risk these traders put in place to actually make fractional profits and then why that whole frequency needs to be there, why you need to do this in volume. And to, from a comparative perspective, this is like, you know, this, I had a client once in the sugar industry and uh, when I was in corporate finance and this is a very similar model, very, very low margins. Your operational processes have to be perfect or you lose money. So real world example. A market maker. Simple strategy on paper. I have to buy a 1001. I have to sell a 1002 to make a penny. I collect passive rebates, potentially, potentially not. There are new markets like CX2, uh, which don't offer passive rebates. They actually charge you for posting liquidity. Uh, but in this example, with a small, uh, uh, small uh, share uh, exposed to the marketplace, you might make a dollar. You are literally posting a thousand dollars worth of risk on the marketplace and you make a dollar, uh, give or take. But if you lose money, you might lose two or three dollars. So you literally, to earn a cost of capital return of 10% on your thousand dollars or a hundred dollars, you've got to be right 90 plus percent of the time because your losing trades will outweigh your winning trades. And I'm going to get again how being right consistently requires uh, low latency. Another example here would be Stat Arb. Uh, again, what many in the industry call good HFT, and, and uh, we, we neither call it neither good or bad because we don't distinguish between trading or high frequency trading, but rather the activity itself. Market making is good. We need liquidity provision in the market. Stat Arb is good. We need, we need uh, linkages between underlying commodities, ETFs, uh, securities prices to have an efficient marketplace. And so th here we give an example of where Inform Flow uh, hits a market maker on, uh, on a uh, uh, underlying security, but the Stat Arb uh, shop knows what's going on in FX markets and readjusts the price down to the appropriate, uh, appropriate level. But how, it still doesn't answer the question why. Why do you, why, why does one need to trade so consistently and in such velocity to actually make this work? Well, again, if we go back to some of the comments around order slicing, liquidity going down in the marketplace, block volume declining, again, driven by broker dealers themselves who wanted to take less risk and now looking for suppliers of liquidity, uh, when securities traded in a nickel and you posted 10,000 shares, you would make quite a lot of money trading. You could trade uh, at a five cent spread, 10,000 shares, uh, you buy, you sell, and you're making, you know, quite a lot of money, $25 a second, $250 a second in this example. Uh, but today, again, as a consequence of decimalization, now your potential margin has gone down by a factor of 80%. How do you make up for that? Well, now you need to do more trades in that period of time to make up for that. And effectively, uh, in the latter example, you need two trades again to make a penny on 100 shares. So you make uh, $100. Uh, and if you're able to execute more frequently, you're basically generating a, a tenth of the profitability per unit of time, but at one one hundredth of the risk. And that's kind of what we're trying to demonstrate here is some of the earlier comments talked about how market making or uh, quantitative trading, it was less risky in nature. But this, what we're trying to show here is that in marketplaces actually allowing for the reduction of time, you actually redu reduce the amount of risk that needs to be traded to achieve a better result from the perspective of spread. May not necessarily be a better result from the perspective of volume posted on the board, uh, but it is from the perspective of spread. And that spread drives transaction costs, and uh, I'm glad I'm not the only one with a formula here, but it's the same idea that you need, there's, there's a uh, risk-free rate of return, you know, there's a risk premium. So where, do, where does the trading community, where do exchanges, how does market structure affect cost, of cop cost capital? We don't affect the risk premium, we don't affect the risk-free rate, we affect transaction costs. And transaction costs, for most trades, have gone down. Uh, for most small size order flow, they have gone down. Uh, and therefore, reduce the average cost of capital for 
uh, issuers in Canada. That's not to say that for very large blocks, it's getting more and more challenging to trade. And again, the difference in our perspective wouldn't be that this is true or not true. I think most students of market structure, you see the facts and you say where they are true, but it's what do you do about it? How do you actually address that? So I'm going to talk specifically to the criticisms of data intensive trading. And again, I'm not a pro nor a con. I'm talking about both. But I want to talk about, again, some specific Canadian uh, circumstances. So the first one uh, is that the liquidity is suspect and the flash crash. These are two kind of uh, tied into each other. So the idea that data intensive traders are not true market makers, they don't have to be there, they're not obliged to be there. Well, they tell you, why should we be, have to be? It's our capital, we have access to the marketplace, it's our decision when we do or don't want to be there. Uh, and what's interesting though is those that have strategies that are enduring and long-term in nature create a voluntary obligation because those strategies implicitly need to know that there is active order flow on the other side to succeed. And what I can tell you with certainty is that in Canada, the flash crash was not exacerbated as it was in the United States because a client of ours stood in the flow. And that is a fact. I was personally on the phone with the market maker or liquidity provider, ELP, whatever you want to call it. And at the time, there was no data feed that was very, really clear or certain about what was going on in the marketplace and prices were falling. When we got on the phone with the client, are you in? We can still see the data. We're confident in our pricing. We're in. So again, we'd be very remiss to compare what the experiences in the United States with the experiences in Canada. And it's one of the key reasons why we did not have similar issues in Canada we did not, that we had in the United States. Now, we do believe that the traditional market makers who do have obligations should also have the uh, whether it's financial or regulatory firepower or, or exposure to some trading rights to also be consistently there in times of duress. It's not true to say that they're always liquid or sorry, always fleeting. They're not always fleeting all the time. Uh, the other point is around uh, increased operational risk. We would agree the more you're going to use computers, the more you're going to have different marketplaces, the more you're going to have different technologies that interface each other, you have increased operational risk, which is why we were uh, at the forefront of pushing for the electronic trading rule implementation in Canada. Uh, those rules effectively go beyond saying you have to have a minimum standard of eligibility from a sophistication perspective, but you actually have to demonstrate you have the systems that are tested and evaluate credit, not just you know, a fat finger, but that you have the financial uh, wherewithal as a firm to participate in the marketplace and manage all this uh, flow of your client and uh, invest a lot, large sums of money in, in both promoting that regulation and complying with that regulation. And uh, most of our order flow was compliant with that uh, over a year in advance. Uh, the other criticism, which I think is important for this community, which I believe has large relevance is that quantitative trading or data intensive trading may crowd out traditional market makers. And uh, the traditional market makers that I have a soft spot for was my first client segment when I was an employee of the TSX. And market makers, again, similar economics to the first point uh, uh, that we, when we talked about quantitative strategies, the difference is they're obliged to be there. So in some ways, they face the same risk reward of having to be right 90% of the time uh, before they lose money, but they're obliged to be there. So if there's something uh, that, that needs to be adjusted in, in Canadian market structure, our perspective is either uh, adjust the program to give those who have, have the obligation, there's a large segment of traders today, 200 professional traders every day trade, post bids and offers and make sure that there's not just a tight spread, but that there's depth and that there's size to your security. They need to have their, uh, their uh, incentives strengthened uh, in the marketplace. I also want to talk about 
Uh, the use of data in a business, just again, maybe to get you guys thinking a little bit differently uh, as you talk about the debate, because I think everyone should participate in the ba debate. No one view is going to get us to the right answer. Uh, so think about the data sets, the petabytes of uh, data that are used by uh, data intensive traders to actually look for patterns. Is that all that different from, say, in geology over the last 10 years? Uh, my father-in-law is a geologist, so he helped me put this together, so I'm not going to take uh, sole credit for this. Uh, but do you, do you, when one thinks of how mining might have been done 100 years ago versus how it is now, it's a lot more quantitative in nature. You're looking at core samples. You're looking at patterns in, in, in structures. Uh, again, not in the business, but just something to think about. And that data provides a service. The faster you get the wrong answer, the faster you are to getting to the right answer. And that's kind of one of the principles of data intensive, big data in general, whether it's in marketing, mining, uh, uh, quantitative trading, uh, social, social uh, networking on, on the internet or those types of, uh, uh, that's kind of the trend now is how that big data is utilized to get to the right answer faster. And so I draw some parallels here whether you're looking at a market or a region to trade, uh, uh, identifying risks, doing them more on a quanti quantitative basis, defining your reserve or you're defining your opportunity for liquidity, a name with, that trades 50 million shares a day and has a penny-wide spread, has a larger reserve value of potential profitability for a quantitative trader than a name that trades two, 300 shares, even at three cents uh, spread. And so that kind of gives an idea why you have those different groupings of where uh, these quantitative traders trade. But the interesting part is once you've made the investment decision, once you've extracted the ore, once you've extracted the profitability of the mine uh, or the price discovery process, the question becomes, is the environment around the mine, is the environment around the price discovery process a private good or a public good? And our view is that Actually, price discovery is a public good, and, and I think it's very hard to argue that it's a public good. I think most people in the room would argue that price discovery is a public good. So the question becomes the externalities around the environment. Uh, and in the case of trading, you have had an explosion of market data. But is that resolved by addressing the symptom or the root cause? And addressing the root cause allows the participants to adjust their behavior rather than eliminating their activity from the marketplace altogether. And what I mean by that, you know, a government could decide, well, we just don't want, we just don't want mining. We just don't want price discovery. Well, that doesn't further the economic progress. The idea ought to be, well, how do you address the actual issue we're concerned about? And in the case of trading, and you know, I don't want to speak too much about your business, I'm not as familiar with it, but in the case of trading, there is a very real externality around the cost of market data and, and the quantity of data that needs to be consumed. And where that's important is in the market ecosystem. And so to date, I don't believe we're yet at the apocalypse. I would disagree with that. I actually think Canada's markets are quite sound, but we need to listen to people like Peter and others who are concerned because they're usually the canary in the coal mine around how things might change. And so today, when one looks at a similarly sized economy with a similarly sized uh, uh, industry, uh, Australia, uh, frankly, Canada, we beat them. We beat them in a number of issues. We beat them in dollars raised. We beat them in the risk taking of the community, your community. We beat them in trading. We beat them in investing. And, you know, we've been a, a locus for. Uh, global interest in this sector for uh, quite a many years. The question is, how do we keep it going? And how do we keep that ecosystem going? And it's important to balance all these needs, listing, as well as the listing requirements on the issuer side uh, and some of those things, but also, importantly, keeping the independent dealer uh, there. So it's convenient to, to claim that, that banks are interested in oligopolies, but the reality of it is, we need in the ecosystem the independent dealer because the independent dealer, in effect, becomes the early manufacturing line for the manufacturing process of going up that scale of 
the small cap to the large domestic to the interlisted security. And we need that manufacturing process to be in place. And what we would argue is the solution is to have a, a, a different regulatory environment that serves the needs of different constituents. You cannot necessarily compare the small cap mining and mineral uh, uh, market ecosystem directly with the need to compete with American securities on a global basis. It's important to think about what would Canada look like if we didn't have some of these evolutions, if we were still trading on the floor without computers, without introducing some of these global participants in the marketplace, what would our Canadian-based interlisted uh, uh, market share look like? And how does that impact lower, you know, sort of smaller cap uh, names on the ecosystems and the incentives to actually take risk? But on the other hand, can you burden the cost of competing at that uh, level of the ecosystem with other parts of the ecosystem? So that's kind of the food for thought I want to leave you with, which is not one that's either pro or con, uh, on one side of the debate or other, but the idea that all aspects of market structure are interrelated, globalization, liquidity fragmentation, the introduction of particip new participants, some of whom are data intensive in trading, the incentives of these data intensive traders, how they generate profit for themselves, how they consequently generate value for others, but as a result, uh, to think about, okay, well, what does that mean for you? And, and I would urge you all, uh, one of my biggest challenges when I was at the exchange was actually getting the comment out. We would deal with large issues that would, would uh, really impact the community, and yet you might get four or five comment letters. I'd urge you all to, to comment on these issues. It's important because the regulators can't work in a vacuum and they need to have a multiplicity of opinion and viewpoint to actually come to the right decision. And I would point out also that uh, it's important for us, uh, again, to echo some of the comments made earlier, that we not look at ourselves in isolation, and we carry the strengths that have helped Canada build some of those uh, uh, differentiators and continue to be foreign markets of a similar size by embracing aspects of competition and global competitiveness, but on the other hand, to do it in a fair way, in a Canadian way, and to do, create solutions that make sense for us and don't necessarily uh, evolve around us copying others. I think we need Canadian solutions, and with the people in this room and elsewhere, we'll, we'll figure it out. But we're not yet at the apocalypse. We're not yet, uh, there's, there's a very healthy market in place uh, the, the question is, how do we make it healthier? And I guess from here, I'd open it up to any questions.